Hello, everybody. Welcome back to I See What You're Saying, the Disciplined Listening Podcast. I'm Michael Reddington, and today I'm so happy to bring to you our next guest, Vanessa Vaughn Matthews. Vanessa is the founder and chief resilience officer of Esfalis, a business resilience advisory firm. In this conversation, I'm so excited to talk to Vanessa as she walks us through how surviving what she calls the perfect storm, I'll let her tell you in her own words, led her to become a nationally sought after crisis management expert. Somebody who works with Fortune 500 organizations down to mid-side organizations all the way around the country, teaching them how to strategically think through, prepare, respond, communicate through crises of all different shapes and sizes and her life experience, her life story on top of her professional experience and expertise makes her the perfect guest for this for this show, for these conversations to help us learn from her perspective and how we can apply it to our lives, certainly in the business world, preparing for crises, also in our personal world and how to apply it beyond those scenarios as well. I want to make sure we give Vanessa as much credit as we can. There's so many accolades to list, but it's important to also note that she was the first woman in the state of Georgia to earn her bachelor's degree in Homeland Security and Emergency Management. Her credentials speak for themselves. She does an amazing job. She's been incredible for me to work with in the past, and I'm really excited to have her on the show today. Before we go any further, certainly have to thank our sponsors. A big thank you to Humantel. Please head over to humantel.com if you are interested in industry-leading training for expanding your skill set on accurately evaluating what people are likely thinking and feeling when you recognize changes in their facial expressions and body language. If you head over there, please enter the code INQUASIVE25, I-N-Q-U-A-S-I-V-E-2-5 for a 25% discount off of all of their online training that they've been so gracious to provide. Also, please head over to Emotional Intelligence Magazine, ei-magazine.com for their ever-growing library of emotional intelligence-related content, articles, videos, podcasts, other interviews, training events, education, so much they have going on there. Please head over and check that out. And of course, for the investigative interviewers, please head over to certifiedinterviewer.com for the International Association of Interviewers. That group is solely focused on providing elite interviewers with the the resources, the network, the skills, the perspectives, the techniques they need to continue to raise the bar and conduct morally, legally, and ethically successful conversations in any context. So head over there again for their resources, for their content, for their webinars, for their event, to check out the certified forensic interviewer designation and see if you qualify. They have so much going on over there. Member conversation, please check out the International Association of Interviewers at certifiedinterviewer.com. So now I appreciate you being here. Thank you very much for chiming or tuning in for another conversation. And without further ado, I introduce to you Vanessa Von Matthews. Good morning, Vanessa. It is fantastic to see you again. How have you been? I have been well. How are you doing? I'm doing very well, thank you. Very well. I am super appreciative that you're carving out the time to talk today. You are involved in so many things and you do so much here in Charlotte and beyond. And hopefully we'll have a chance to touch on even just a few of those today with the time that we have. But I'm really excited to share not only what you do, but the lessons you learn and the insights that you have for people. So when we first met, I was introduced to you essentially as a crisis management expert, if that's a fair way to say it. So you do a a lot of work in that space. And I'm sure since some random occurrence happened in 2020, the name of which is escaping me, your business has probably been, well, I know it's been because I've been watching you on fire since then. Uh, But I would love it if you could take a minute and just clue us all into what lit your passion for crisis management to begin with. Yeah. Well, first, let me share. I'm excited about today because the first time I met you, was also on a podcast. <laughs> so to be back here a few years later is uh, pretty interesting. So I'm excited about that. And thank you for the invitation. Of course. So what got me interested was really two things. One, I was studying the science of Homeland Security and emergency management. So I graduated from a uh, the only historically Black college in the country uh, that has a degree program tailored to Homeland Security and and emergency management. And ultimately that led me to become the first female in the state with that degree. But while I was obtaining that education, I experienced a tornado with wind speeds exceeding 135 miles per hour. 
that picked up my vehicle while I was inside, totaled the car, and then dropped it. And it was that experience that helped me to better understand what it's like when people go through crisis, when you don't know. Um, and also, at the time, that happened in the city of Atlanta. So it was the first tornado on record to hit the city. One person lost their life. 50 people lost their homes. It destroyed the buildings, the businesses. And it took months for the city to be able to recover from that incident. And I was unprepared. I had no idea that I was in the middle of a tornado. There was no daylight. It was actually mid-April in 2008. And there were no sirens or any warnings or any communications. And it's just a typical crisis situation that we see play out, you know, whether it's a tornado, a hurricane, or a, a train derailment, right? Um, and so I, I had the opportunity to kind of live through my first experience. 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 Like, like, could you minimize that anymore? I, I, got to, I got to live through my first experience. You, I'm picturing a movie scene, like when the star comes over to you and says, are you okay? And you're like, yeah, because you just survived a ride in a tornado. <laughs> like, that is unbelievable. Yeah. I, you know, we get asked this all the time, right? What led you to start your career? And we ask people that. And it's, you know, my parents did this, or I had a professor, or I, you know, I saw this, I met this person. No, I went for a ride in a tornado that I never saw coming and decided that was a problem. Well, obviously, I'm very happy that you made it through unscathed. Uh, and also, that was interesting in how you tell the story, how you call out the deficiencies that allowed that to happen. And I'm certainly not, please don't take this, anybody listening from Atlanta, like I'm not calling out the city of Atlanta 15 years later. Um, but the lack of preparedness, the lack of warning, the lack of even awareness that it could happen potentially led people to be in a situation they otherwise would have avoided had that preparation been in place. Uh, and also before we continue, congratulations on being the first woman in Georgia to earn the degree. That's, <laughs> that's pretty fascinating and shouldn't be overlooked as well. Um, so with this, spinning it to the business side now. So you survive the tornado, you're sitting there in your wrecked SUV thinking, I guess this is what I'm gonna do now. <laughs> Had an epiphany, a moment of clarity in a tornado. You, you build that into your career after your education. I've also heard you speak in tandem, crisis management and business resilience. After hearing your quick introduction, I have a really good idea on the foundation of your personal resilience. When we talk about business resilience, what does that mean and how does that relate to crisis management? Yeah, so that's a great question. So my simple definition is, Business resilience is all about the capabilities that a company or an organization has in place to recover from disruption as quickly as possible. So business resilience, really that terminology started with IBM years ago before people started to grasp onto it. Thanks to COVID, everybody now uses the word resilience, but from a subject matter expert perspective, it's truly an interdiscipline of several things to include business continuity, crisis management, um, crisis communications, emergency management, emergency preparedness, incident response, disaster recovery, cybersecurity, disaster recovery, which is specifically on an IT level, supply chain risk. So all of those different things that I just said are, are the, the, the partners or the functions to include safety and security. Those are all of the, the different stakeholders who own a piece of risk management in a typical business, right? And so you can't really have business resilience unless you have all those different things that I talked about. And depending on the size or the level or the complexity of your business, those things may exist, they may not exist, or there's a different level of maturity. So that's resiliency. Crisis management is three things. How do you protect your, your reputation, your profitability, and your operations in a crisis situation? So think if there is a incident that happens. We're in Charlotte. There was a fire yesterday in the, the south side of Charlotte. If there's a fire that happens, how am I responding to the crisis in the first, let's give it 24 to 72 hours? 
and how you, all of the preparation before the incident prepares you for how you're going to respond versus react in that first 24 to 72 hours. And everything you do or don't say or everything you do or don't do impacts your reputation, your profitability, and your operations. And so crisis management on paper looks like a team of individuals, maybe from three to five or three to seven people that have a function, that have a role in planning, preparing, and executing. How is this brand? How is this organization going to respond effectively? What are all the different things that we need to be paying attention to? Who are the people that we need to communicate with? How many stakeholders? What are the avenues for how we do that? How do we ensure that if we're a publicly traded company, what's the potential reputational risk? How do we ensure that our board of directors is prepared? What about the employees? What are we communicating? What are we not uh, uh, communicating? What, what information do our customers need? Are there operational delays that we need to plan on? If it's a supply chain issue, how does that impact your customers or the employees? So there's several things that companies should be executing. But in order for you to execute that, the plan for it, the preparedness for it, the training for it should be a cycle that's always happening before the crisis. And then once the crisis hits, how do we discuss what went well and what didn't so that we can better pre prepare or mitigate some of those risks when the next thing comes that we're not expecting? Love it. So to me, if I may take something that you have spent your whole professional career developing and just illustrating and over summarize it without offending you. It almost sounds like taking like an emergency res emergency services response approach to planning and running our business. Mm -hmm. So you know, firefighters don't just wake up and say, Oh, there's a fire. We sh what should we grab? What should we do? Let's talk this through. They they've practiced it. They've got a place. So it sounds like applying that same mindset to our businesses. Absolutely. You said something in there, respond versus react. And one of the cool things I've always enjoyed about our conversations, of which there are many, is the maybe unexpected intersection of what we do and the thought process and sort of strategic application that, that overlaps. There's, I think, a really important moment there to highlight the difference. When you think about the difference between responding and reacting, what does that mean to you? So to me, <laughs> the outcome of reacting is I might have to apologize or I make a mistake because I didn't think about it. Responding is I thought about it, I breathed, I inhaled, and I carefully spent some time before I just put something out there, whether it's a text, an email, or a conversation. So if I just let's just bring this into my home since I'm married and so are you. If my husband says something to me that, I don't know, sends me off on, on, on an alarm, reacting is yelling, raising my voice, getting an attitude, all the things that I might do. <laughs> allegedly, allegedly. Allegedly, right? Or if my husband says something that kind of ticks me off a little bit, responding is, hmm. Think about that. I'm going to process that because I know he's never going to do anything with the intent to harm me. So are you taking this personal right now? Is that, is that what has some animosity in your heart? Let's think about this before you say something. Honey, thank you so much for bringing that to my attention. Would you mind if we talk about that as soon as I come out of this meeting? Give me time to think. That way, I'm not apologizing for how I showed up and coming out of character <laughs> when I reacted. <laughs> especially at home where in my experience sorry brooke it's the easiest place to do it sometimes it's the easiest. yeah <laughs> yeah for sure and i have a sneaking suspicion though that in your household some of those things are resolved over a wonderful meal if i recall correctly man <laughs> <laughs> so so you've got that i can't cook at least at least you guys have that going for you that that respond versus react thing is so important and I love the way that you just said it right out of the gate. If I react, I might have to apologize. And often I feel like when we react like that, it's because whatever we observed, either we filter it through our expectations 
So as we filter it through our expectations, it either meets a negative expectation or it completely violates a positive expectation, like one or the other. And so typically the first words that we start to say are the wrong words to say because they'll make us feel better. And at the expense of us feeling better, it almost certainly is going to make somebody else feel worse. So having the, the frame of mind to, to pause, think it through, respond instead of react, the home front is a great example for that. Our regular business conversations are a great example for that. How much more important is that in a crisis situation where people are panicked, stressed, fear of the unknown is skyrocketing, ambiguous details are surrounding them? How much more important is it in those scenarios? Oh, it's critical because, so let's just, so, so again, we're in Charlotte. There's a lot of things currently happening in our city. Yep. So, and one of those things is surrounding transportation. Mm -hmm. So our transportation system is owned by a local government, which is the city of Charlotte, and it runs through multiple other municipalities. So you have the public who, who utilizes said transportation. You have businesses where there might be a bus stop in front of their business or a train track that runs through their street or very near. So any type of issue or risk doesn't just affect the city. It affects the people who take that transportation. It affects the schools, the, the businesses who are in direct line of that transportation. So the reason why it's so important, especially in times of crisis, is typically there's a lot of information. You don't know what's real and what's not. You have public trust or the trust of your customers or your employees. And we're in a day and age where what you say, how you say it, what you believe in, what you don't believe in, those things create social risks within the business that have that that then bubble up. And if people don't feel like you're honest with them, let's take it a step further. This is a employee-driven hiring market at the moment. So they will leave. <laughs> Period. <laughs> and they're constantly being poached as we speak, right? So now you give your people options when you don't handle things accordingly. Um, but also, there's a lot of data that also shows, especially for those that are publicly traded, for every day that your crisis continues, the value of your business begins to decrease from a financial perspective, but also it impacts your response and your recovery. So our job in the world of business continuity and resilience is crisis happens. If it impacts your people, your technology, your suppliers, or your facilities, our job is to help you get those things back up running as quickly as possible so you continue to meet the service level agreements that you have in place. Every day that you're not up and running as, as quickly as possible, you're losing business. It, it's impacting how you operate. And so some clients, it's a $75 million expense for every day that their business is not up and running. Depending on the size of your business, that might be super impactful, right? So if I'm delayed, it's costing me more. If it's costing me more, how does that impact my insurance? What we're doing with our customers? Oh, and then at what point am I going to be available and able to go back and fulfill the orders for the customers or for whoever we are serving through our business? And so it just creates more chaos. So it's critically important to have crisis management in place. But oftentimes people will say, well, my IT team can, can do that well, or this group can do that well. But what we see is my job is to trust, but verify. Where's the documentation that supports that? Where's the foundation? And how often are we practicing those muscles so that it's muscle memory? Or if the key decision maker is not here, who's the person who's going to do that? And do they know that? Because oftentimes they don't. And we work with Every large size business, we work with medium sized businesses, and there's commonalities that we see throughout all of those. So that's why it's critically important. Can you call out some of those commonalities? You probably did with that explanation. The paperwork's not in place. They don't know if the if the, if the CEO's on vacation and something happens. You've got the CHRO, the COO, and the CFO going. You know, you know, you know, you. And the the problem's getting worse. Um, are there other common call-outs that people should be aware of either in the planning or in the communication process? That's a great question. Uh, you've named some. I have named some. I think a few are where does responsibility versus accountability sit? Typically, when you start talking about accountability, people don't like that, but it's important because then you start uh, pointing fingers and that's not value 
that's not valuable for your employees or or for your customers. Number two is it's it's good to have very clear objectives and measures of success so that we understand what right looks like, right? So and a transportation company might have one requirement or one expectation for how they want to manage a crisis or a response or what the objectives are. But a healthcare company might be totally different because I'm operating on people and bodies around the world. And so it's very important to have clear expectations about how we measure success in times of crisis, meaning what's my response time? How quickly should I communicate? If I send out a, a, a communication, what's the response rate that's our standard so that we know that the right people receive that message? That's important. Um, I'm big and we are big on words, our words on paper, but words don't move, people do. So oftentimes we see that organizations don't do a lot of training. And even if they do do training, one of the biggest concerns is when it's time to document what worked and what did not work in that incident, the execution to fix those gaps doesn't happen. And that's a problem. We as a society are short term thinkers. And, you know, which is why most of us don't have the appropriate insurance coverages for the things that create risk in our lives, whether it's your automobile, your home, a flood insurance, we don't have the appropriate levels as a, as a society. And so because we are reactive in our mindset and we only want to focus on things once the problem happens, it creates bigger issues in the business, which ultimately supports a reactive culture. So those would be three things that I would say are often <laughs> on the table or things that we see. I appreciate you sharing those and also motivating me to go back and double check all my insurance policies this afternoon when I get home. So thank you for that. Um, it also reminds me of a line from a movie. It's an old Robert Redford movie. Long story short, nobody cares, but essentially he's asking his assistant to, to put away some files for him. Like he gives her an envelope, you know, put this somewhere. And she says, well, why are you doing this? And he looks at her and says, when did Noah build the ark? Mm. And she looks at him funny and he just says, before it rained, it walks away. And then, of course, by the end of the movie, it rains and they need the folder. And it was a great plan and it all comes together. But that's one of those lines that's always stuck with me. Usually when I realize I didn't build the ark in enough time. <laughs> but, you know, when did Noah build the ark? Before it rains, if you're waiting for the rain, if it's going to be too late is I try to keep up with so much that you're sharing, and thank you for that, and keep defaulting back through my bias, of course, to, okay, well, if we're creating these plans, there are probably many constituents we not only need to be thinking about, but also listening to as we do that. And once any of us reach a certain level of responsibility within an organization, or actually say it this way, as we increase in levels of responsibility in organizations, we typically decrease in motivation to listen to other people. We end up with more experience. We end up with more responsibility. We end up with less time to execute. So we look at our success as being emblematic of the quality of our decision-making skills. And we're literally less incentivized to listen to other people. So if there are leaders listening to this right now thinking, well, Mike is double checking his insurance, I should be double checking my crisis management plans, business resiliency plans, business continuity plans. Who should they be listening to as they seek out the necessary information, partnerships, plans as they go ahead and put this program together? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I'm going to do a shameless plug for my industry. <laughs> Person who's in your business that is responsible for risk management, that's responsible for business continuity for crisis management, um, the person who's responsible for supply chain risk, I'm naming what some of our clients have these roles titled as your company. It might be the human resources person. What I see a lot of in our profession is we're not inviting the right people to the table early before we have to build the ark or before the rain comes. And those are the people who actually know, one, all the risks that are happening within the business. They see how interconnected those risks are and how it impacts the operations of the business, how it impacts the financials, how it impacts the people within the business. So that is the number one key stakeholder that is needed. Um, because, and so, so here's what's interesting. One thing that I loved about corporate and working in risk management is you learn the whole business because everybody has risk. 
Sales has risk. Marketing has risk. Operations has risk. Supply chain has risk. Frontline, operational, strategic teams have risk. Everybody has risks. And every day, every decision is a risk decision. Risk is hazard and it's opportunity. It can be great and it can be bad. As Asphalus is growing. We'll be 10 years old next year. That's great. That's great risk. But it's also bad because growth sucks the cash out of your business, which is your lifeline, right? But it's great because, oh, we're growing and we can hire and we're doing all these new, new, new different things. But it sets up and creates several challenges at the same time. And so that would be the number one person um, that is needed at the table. And if that person doesn't exist, there's probably someone within the organization that knows, or it's time for you to make an investment in a partner from a crisis management perspective, resiliency or security, whatever that risk is that you're trying to solve for, it's time for you to make an investment in a key person. That's a great call out. And congratulations on 10 years. That's awesome. <laughs> Thank you. I hope I'm I hope I'm in town when you schedule the celebration. Look, because I'm already planning it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not doubting. I'm not doubting. <laughs> and I can't wait to sample the food. Um, <laughs> when you talk about getting the right person to, to be in charge, to head it up, to take accountability, responsibility for putting the team together in the program, it's not a one person job for most organizations, I'm sure. Are there particular attributes or personality traits? that you've seen set people up to be more successful in handling crisis situations? Really great question. So there's two things I'll share. Um, one, when crisis situations happen, it's one thing to plan for them. It's another thing to figure out what's actually going to happen because everybody's different. So for one example, we had a customer who had an employee that was killed at their facility. And the, the entire team had a great relationship with that employee and it happened at their site. And so they immediately had to respond and some of it was reacting. And what they did not plan for was how emotional it would be for that team. And so just think about it. When you're emotional, when your energy is high, when you're crying or when you're angry, we typically don't make good decisions, Right. And that was something that stuck out to them as they kind of looked back and took a second look on what the activities were as they were aware of the news and then as they had to resolve that particular issue. The second thing is in working with the retail company, we were asked to help them set up their crisis management team. And they wanted, so, so typically a crisis management team has a crisis management lead. And that is the, the person that is filtering the the communication to the CEO and his or her direct reports. But they're also managing the crisis at an enterprise level for the business. And this particular company wanted a duo role. So we started to look at, to the, to the point that you made before we started recording, what are the attributes of the, of the great candidate that we're looking for? How do we measure success for the crisis management team leader? What's the personality traits? What do we need need from them? So I would say in this particular role or this particular organization, what they learned is they needed a driver. I need somebody who will make a decision. And even if it's the wrong decision, I need you to make a decision. I need you to be able to guide the troops. I need you to be able to tell me with confidence, here's what we're going to do. Here's, here's what we're not going to do. Here's what the priorities are. Here's what the priorities are not. And we needed somebody in that role um, that could command and control and run an incident. But we also needed someone who looked at things differently and who had more relational skills, who was easier to talk to people, who was more approachable. And that way we had the appropriate balance because the culture of the organization was more of that relational base, but the leadership team needed a driver that they could trust to really make decisions. And so those are two examples of why personalities matter and what you may or may not be looking for as you think through what the crisis management team may look like for your company. That's that's a great point in a super interesting duality. Like I need somebody who can make difficult decisions in a short amount of time under ambiguous circumstances, embrace the risk involved and just make forward progress while at the same time 
having a unique perspective on a set of events and being compassionate and empathetic and understanding of how this event, I'm sure people with all those quality traits are just on the corner waiting to get hired. I'm sure they're everywhere. That's Um, the hard part. (laughs) (laughs) But I know someone that they can call if they don't have someone in house. Same as fuck. But that might not, like they might be looking at their role and say, well, it needs to be our ops manager or it needs to be our VP of risk or maybe our CHRO or whoever. But if those people don't have the personality traits to be successful when the hopefully metaphorical tornado hits, yeah. then maybe those people do need to be a part of the process, but they don't need to be the leader of the team in that situation. So you bring up a great point. In my previous experience in aviation, that was one thing that is key in our industry, which I love. Your title is irrelevant when it comes to a crisis. What crisis managers and crisis teams need are the people who are most effective at helping the company to get through a crisis. And so in my experience, I work in every level of leadership, but the best crisis managers that I've seen are the the managers, the person who reports to your director, because you have all, all, all the relationships, you know the business, you have experience managing crises, especially if you're leaving safety or security, it's pretty a... It's it's typically someone who's pretty steady in those types of high intensity environments, mm-hmm. and they know how to get stuff done. That's that's such an amazing call out. It, it goes back to now. I'm being a little bit biased. A question I asked before, but that like that who leaders should listen to. Like if they just have the top level leaders in the room, what pulse do they really have on what's going on at the front line of their business? And what pulse do they really have on what it takes to connect with the people at every level in the business? Whereas the managers a little bit further down the org chart likely have that experience, like we have that perspective, are likely dealing with those types of stresses to a degree on a regular basis and would have very meaningful contributions. Yeah. Well, I think a great leader listens to the people in your business. Um, that are going to help you to see what you need to see. So our tagline uh, is we help you see so you can solve. And we believe that in order for you to solve it, you have to see it. But if you can't see it, you can't solve for it. So the work we do with the assessments, with the audits, et cetera, trainings and exercises help businesses to be able to see better so that you actually know. So what am I truly solving for? Because oftentimes we get symptoms but as a person with a background in risk, we appreciate some root cause. So great leaders are not just listening to the senior leadership team or the senior executive, because nine times out of 10, you don't know because you don't do that. <laughs> Your job is to strategize, to direct, to move obstacles out of the way. But typically, depending on how your business is structured, you're not doing I want to talk to the person who's doing. I want to talk to the person who who knows the challenges, who knows the personalities, who knows the roadblocks, who will tell you the truth about what I really need um, because that those are your true subject matter experts. So we always say, we know a lot when it comes to resiliency and crisis management, but what I don't know is your business. So help me to understand what's going to be most effective here and how do we take what's standard in the industry, but what's going to fit your culture? Those are two different things. Love it. Now, I'm, I mentioned my bias before. So for me, listening, communication, all of these things, I'm thinking, okay, a crisis has occurred. Hopefully not like the fire that happened yesterday, which is tragic, but maybe it could be any level of crisis. A crisis has occurred. We now have a leadership team looking to navigate and recover from that crisis. We have a team of employees, managers underneath them that are looking to fully understand what has happened, what's the effect on the business, what's the effect on them, who should they trust, what happens next, where is this going? So when we think about those factors that are constantly fluctuating, what should leaders keep in mind the most when they are communicating with their subordinates during a crisis who are experiencing greater levels of stress and ambiguity than the leaders are who are trying to solve the problem? I would say three things, trust, openness, and transparency. Um, 
when I was a kid and I did something wrong and I knew my teacher was going to call my mom, I had a split second decision. You can tell her first or your teacher can tell her. Because if your teacher tells her she's going to create a story, it's going to be hard for you to be able to maneuver around that. So the sooner you can get out the truth and quickly and have some integrity, the better it is. Um, we never want to lead people to assume. And that's hard. I mean, I, I'm sure I lead people to assume in our own business because we're a small business and we're running a million miles an hour. Um, but it's a challenge when people are left with only an assumption to assume and they start to create stories, which is why communication is so important. And I think it's also okay to say, I don't know. I don't know. But when I do know, I will let you know. <laughs> um, you know, I think sometimes we 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 may want to appear like we have it all together or like we have it all figured out. And to your point, your employees know that you don't, number one, because they too are human and you put your pants on like everybody else does. And so I just think that it's important to be level to to level set and to be a human. Um, I think that's important to keep in mind. Amen. All of that. <clears throat> the trust, the transparency. When people, especially under ambiguous circumstances, people tend to fill in the gaps and create those stories you talked about from a place of fear and negativity. Mm -hmm. So they're not going to sit there and think, you know what? I'm sure this isn't nearly as bad as I'm worried about. I bet our leadership team has this completely under control. It's probably overblown. It's going to be like, this never happens. They're going to be at the opposite end of the spectrum higher levels of stress, greater levels of ambiguity, assuming the worst. I mean, it, one of the jokes we make is if a leader calls somebody into their office for any type of meeting, please don't say, come in, sit down, shut the door. Because nothing good has ever happened after that, ever. Like as soon as somebody hears, come in, sit down, shut the door, like I'm getting fired. How, how did that happen? Where did this come from? Actually, no, you're here for a raise and a promotion. We fill ambiguous circumstances in generally with stories that are fear-based. So being able to navigate through that is so very important. And your comment about just being a human and understanding what other people are thinking and feeling and communicating to those feelings as opposed to just the facts. The one other thought I would add, and I'd love your feedback on this, is I love, if you don't know, tell them you don't know, and I'll get back to you when I do. But folk, when you're in that communication, focus on the process you're using to figure it out. So if I just say to somebody, I don't know, and I'll get back to you when I do, okay, I hope so. But if I say, listen, right now, I don't know. But here's who we're talking to. Here are the facts we're considering. Here's the time frame we have. Here are the resources we're leveraging. And one way or another, I'll have an answer or at least an update for everybody by X. Yep. So now they don't have to trust that I know, but they can trust in the process I put in place. And then when I follow up, when I say I do, now I'm creating that greater level of trust in me in the process throughout it. So I think even that extra level of specificity on the process can really help fill those gaps of ambiguity when we don't know. Yeah, for sure. And, and what you just said, telling people your process and what you are doing is still telling them something. Yes. Something important. Yep. Like, I'm not just sitting at my desk hoping that phone is going to ring and someone's going to have a magic answer for me. <laughs> like, I'm actively taking responsibility for this. Love that. So many great thoughts on crisis management, business continuity. I feel like I could mine your expertise for that for hours. And I know you juggled your schedule to get this interview in today. And I really do appreciate it. Getting a chance to turn the tables, if you will. Because I think you've interviewed me several times. Um, but you also spend some time in another space that is critically important. Always has been, but now more than ever, now being a, a, a term for the several years. Um, but you are more frequently sought out as somebody with valuable expert opinions, thoughts in the DEI conversation space. And I am extremely interested in what you have learned in regards to listening and communication under very stressful and emotional situations, which is what you do for a career and how, I guess I'm asking, I'm failing in my own game. I'm asking compound circuitous questions. 
in your career, so much of what you do is strategy and communication under emotional and stressful times. In the space of DEI, so many of those conversations are flooded with stress and high emotions and all of those things. As we pivot and talk just a little bit about the DEI conversations you've been leading, what have you learned or experienced in having the same type of stressful and emotional conversations in that field? Yeah, that's a great question. So I'll give a little bit of backstory before I share what I've learned. So again, I'm a Homeland Security and Emergency Management major, never went to school for, for diversity and inclusion, don't even have a certification. What I do have experience in is a few things. Graduating from a historically Black college and university and spending the first five years plus in corporate and systematic in, in racism, in, in organizations that foster systematic racism. And being clueless the first five years of my career that I was in a system of structural racism. So I, so I thought I was crazy. It wasn't until, honestly, a few weeks ago, talking to a former colleague that I was like, is that what <laughs> So that's one. Um, the second thing, I have experience as a Black female millennial. And those are typically the three things that work for me or against me. It just depends on where I'm at. The third thing I have experience in is being a Black female millennial in corporate America, reporting to white males and white women who see the world differently than how I see it. So when George Floyd was murdered, I had a customer who asked me to speak to them about what to say or to not say in response to his murder. And what I appreciate about George Floyd was that he forced me to look at myself and to think about how am I showing up about the issues that matter in my community and being honest and transparent with people, even if they don't like it. Because respectfully, I'm not here for likes, I'm here for business, right? You really don't have to, so, so, so people say, well, I have to know you like you and trust you. You don't really have to like me. <laughs> Trust, I'll give you that. Know me, you don't even have to know me. There's people who I do business with and I don't like them, but I know that you're going to get the job done and I can trust your quality of work, right? So George Floyd gave me the permission to be honest and to hold people accountable, including myself. And so I owe it to my community and Whoever you are, if you're on my LinkedIn profile, you are part of my community. If you're on my team, if you're a customer, you're part of my uh, community. So what I've learned about some of these situations when it comes to matters of diversity, of diversity and inclusion, and I can speak from three vantage points, in supporting clients in this space, for some reason... As a society, and I'm speaking to America, we are uncomfortable with talking about race relations. And similar to every day, right? If I don't apologize to my husband for reacting and coming out of character, it's going to create some tension in our household until we address the elephant in the room. And America has gone over 500 years without truly addressing the elephant in the room and taking some responsibility and some accountability for our actions. And until we get there, it will not be resolved because you're putting a Band-Aid on a crater, <laughs> right? That's number one. Number two, what I've seen is I was asked to do a keynote last year on DE&I to security leaders. And what was interesting is for people who don't believe that racism happened that the United States and England enslaved Black and brown people across the, the world and built the entire world on the backs of us for free. For people who don't believe that, they also don't believe in global warming. They also don't believe in um, uh, um, several of the things that are happening from an environmental perspective. These are some of the same people that may not believe that COVID really didn't happen or COVID you know, that COVID wasn't a mass pandemic that impacted the global world. Um, so there's some commonalities with how politics 
is trying to infiltrate reality and the way different people perceive those things, there was a commonality around it. So if 80% scored, let's just say this, this, this keynote as effective and of value, the same 20% scored it as not effective and not of value, but it wasn't just about the ENI. It was about guns on the streets and gun violence in America. It, it was about global warming and the issues with, with the environment. All of those same things scored low. And so that's something that was interesting. And I would say the third thing that I've seen is leaders who talk the talk, but don't walk the walk. So it's hard to transfer responsibility, right? As a CEO, if you say that you care about de &I, then the buck stops with you. So typically, if your sales and your marketing strategy fails, somebody getting fired or we're making a change because no business can survive without sales. But when it comes to equ equity and inclusion, it's allowed to fail. And I've seen leaders who transfer responsibility. Well, I want this group of volunteers to do it. So, so, so let me get this straight. You get paid to be the CEO, right? Yeah. So you want somebody to do what you get paid to do? You want them to do it for free? And then you don't want to equip them with the tools, the foundation, or anything that they need to be successful, nor do you deliver it in a responsible manner, but yet you have the same expectation. Would that work on your sales team? No. So why do you think it should work over here? So those are examples of what I've seen. Said a lot. You did. You did. <laughs> and all valuable. So for me, obviously, at this point in the conversation, listening is the most important thing. <laughs> um, as you've communicated, well, actually, no, I want to go back one. Because as you listed out your qualification, like before you started answering the question, you said, well, hang on, you know, I, I don't have a certification and you listed your education and corporate experience and life experience and all those things. That in and of itself is a crystal clear illustration that goes beyond an example you made earlier in our conversation. Like the right person to lead your crisis management efforts might not necessarily be the person with the title or the degree. There's somebody else here whose totality of their life experience and potential and problem-solving ability better suits them for this role. So for me, being extremely respectful, having this conversation, okay, there's not a certification there. So look at the history, the perspective, all of this other stuff that goes with it that qualifies somebody well beyond what a sheet of paper could. And I'm not I don't want that to come across as somebody who's pursuing a, a formal education on the topic. It isn't worth it. It most certainly is. But that doesn't necessarily qualify you to provide the insight that people need to grow or develop in any certain area. So I think that was another very important illustration of that. So as you've had these conversations with your clients, and I would assume there's a range, some that are fully committed, some that want to be committed. Some that say the right things, but don't necessarily follow up. And some that might not even say the right things. As you look at some of the interactions you've had, what have been some of the most important communication lessons that you've learned or seen as people have evolved and made changes in this space? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, and I can, I'll speak just purely about me. Because okay. I, yeah. So I think one thing that, ha that has been important is for Vanessa Matthews to shut up, be quiet, and listen. Because I can react because I've lived what you just highlighted, right? It, because I have lived experience, I have less tolerance and less patience. <laughs> However, if a customer is hiring me, whether it's a keynote, whether it's to help them with their DE&I coaching, or whether it's to help them... Uh, to communicate in the middle of a global pandemic when you have supply chain issues and you have uh, 60 countries who have participated in 120 days of active protesting from the murder of George Floyd, and you're calling me because I'm your only Black vendor for a Fortune 500 company, either way, I need to focus on responding versus reacting. 
And so even still, I have to shut up and be quiet and listen and understand where are they at and where are they trying to be? And how do you take your emotions out of it, your own personal truths, and put that to the side? So that is, that's the, that to me is the number one thing that matters. Because to your point, I reach people from all different spectrums and all different aspects, and they all have different lived experiences. And a lot of it is things that we've been taught on both sides. Um, you know, things that you've learned, things that you've experienced. And so while I want people to listen to me and to take me for value, it's, I think it's inappropriate and it's selfish to not do the same thing. I recently had a conversation with a, another gentleman in the HR space here in the Charlotte area. And he used a phrase that I'm going to steal and give him credit for as long as I can remember where it came from. But eventually I'm, I'll probably just take it from him. We've, he knows. Um, but he called it evolved engagement. Mm. And to me, I feel like what you just described in one of, if not the most difficult space to have that evolved perspective in is exactly that is the self-awareness, the bigger picture awareness, the, to me, it, and to me, it sounds like there are greater goals and a greater impact that you are looking to be a part of. And if how you enter into the opportunity to create that impact might not be exactly the way you want every time mm -hmm. being able to quote, sit down, be quiet, shut up and listen, then allows us to work towards creating that impact. Did I summarize that in a way that is accurate? Oh yeah. I mean, I, sometimes I'll say, I'm, let's, let's plant the seed, let's water it and let's give it some sunlight and we'll come back and see how it grows. But you know, I'm also a, a woman of faith and I wholeheartedly personally believe that the issues of structural racism that we're dealing with in America, it's, it's not a flesh issue. It's not a Vanessa Matthews and a, a Mike issue. It's a heart issue. It's a spiritual issue. Um, that's just me personally. <laughs> so, so I am learning as I mature, like my fine wine here, right? <laughs> that the more mature, the more experience um, that God allows me to have, the easier it is for me to see what's the real issue here. And I think that is where, um, that's where my faith comes in. That's a powerful perspective. And I believe it's reasonable to say that more people on all sides of all hot button issues, if they could work to evolve to that perspective, let me at least listen. Maybe I learned something new. Maybe there's a new perspective. Maybe there's something I didn't previously understand or see. And maybe if I hear it today, I still don't. But maybe I've got to hear it in three or four more conversations before it finally hits me like a hammer. And I'm like, oh, it's been here. Now I see it. Now I understand it. So it's amazing to hear that from you. And I know I've seen some emotional videos that you posted before and, and different things that, you, that you've said before. Um, so this is, you know, to clarify for folks, it's in addition to and separate from the, the business that you run in the clients that you take care of. But from, again, from my bias, from how we show up, how we listen, how we communicate, how we create impact in stressful situations. You, I have so much respect for you and so much fascination and appreciation for what you do because of how it intersects and crosses in those different areas. And I thought it would be important to at least take a few minutes to call that out and share that. And, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to do that. Absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> So I know you juggled your schedule around to be here today, and I'm very, very thankful. Hopefully, there are many people listening right now that are thinking about their business in some way, shape, or form and thinking, Vanessa sounds like a person I should probably try to connect with. For people to learn more about Asphalus and Vanessa Matthews, where do they need to go? Yeah, so I am Vanessa V. Matthews with one T on LinkedIn and Twitter, and our website is www.asfalis, A-S-F-A-L-I-S, -S advisors with an O.com. And we also are on uh, Twitter and LinkedIn. Thank you very much. I'll make sure to share all of those links, everything in the show notes when this goes live very soon. 
Vanessa, it is always amazing to see you and talk with you. I really thank you for sharing your time with us today. And I can't wait to see you around town again very soon. Vanessa, once again, thank you so much for taking the time out of your crazy calendar in order to come on and share your thoughts, your experiences, your story with us. Unbelievable story for somebody who literally got dropped out of a tornado and then decided, I want to have this impact on the rest of the world, help them prepare, manage, navigate through crisis so other people don't have to experience what you experienced. And thank you for sharing your personal thoughts on your journey, what you've experienced over the last several years, how that's impacted you as a listener, and what the rest of us can learn from that experience as well. So thank you for sharing all of that. And hopefully everybody who tuned in got multiple things from that conversation to impact how we plan, how we communicate, how we navigate difficult situations and conversations in our personal and professional life. Vanessa, thank you so much. And of course, on the way out, let's thank our sponsors one more time. HumanTel, head over to humantel.com and enter the code INCLUSIVE25 for 25% off of all of their online training for reading facial expressions of emotion, changes in body language, understand what people are likely thinking and feeling based on your observations. Emotional Intelligence Magazine, head over to ei-magazine.com and check out their ever-expanding library of emotional intelligence-related content, videos, articles, interviews, podcasts, events, training, education, so much going on over there. Check it out. And of course, please, for the professional investigators, check out the International Association of Interviewers at certifiedinterviewer.com. That's where you can learn, go, go to learn more about what the International Association of Interviewers is doing every day to help increase the tools, perspectives, skills, techniques that elite interviewers are providing in all of their conversations. So you can head out over there to check out their conversation between members, their resources, their educations, their upcoming events, the membership benefits, what it takes to join, and of course, the Certified Forensic Interviewer designation. So please check out certifiedinterviewer.com for the International Association of Interviewers. And thank you all again for taking the time to join this conversation. I really appreciate it today. Please share your feedback with us. Do what the algorithms love. Give Vanessa and all of our great guests the extra exposure they deserve. So please like, share, comment, tell your friends, all of these things. If you have someone you think would be a great guest, please share. Let us know so we can invite them on the show and share their wonderful perspective as well. We appreciate everybody being here. Thank you so much. Please stay safe. Take care of each other. And we'll see you next time.